are, I invite you to get comfortable if you can, perhaps light a candle, take a breath, take a moment of intention, and we will center our hearts and our minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. We will now pray the prayer of confession. God, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be human. We confess to you. God, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. God, we confess to you. God, we cut ourselves off from each other, and we erect barriers of division. God, we confess to you. God, we confess that by silence and ill-considered words, we have built up walls of prejudice. God, we confess that by selfishness and lack of empathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness. Come fill this moment and free us from our sin. Amen. Amen. People of God, hear this good news. God loves us more than we can imagine. Christ tears down barriers of division. The Spirit speaks peace to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray in praise as we open our holy scriptures. Great is, O King, our happiness in thy kingdom. Thou our King. We dance before thee, our King, by the strength of thy kingdom. May our feet be made strong. Let us dance before thee, eternal. Give ye praise, all angels, to the one above, who is worthy of praise. Amen. Today's reading comes to us from Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Adonai had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest, Ezra, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed Adonai, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped God, with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to Adonai your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all people wept when they read the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of, of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to Adonai. And do not be grieved, for the joy of Adonai is your strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See a humble 
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Jesus. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of God is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the good news of the gospel. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What stories does your family tell? My family likes to tell a story about my Swedish grandmother who spent the summer, she was 16 years old, working a summer job with the Swedish army. She and a group of girls were armed, sent up a watchtower on a remote Baltic island, and told to watch the skies for Nazis. And though this happened during World War II, obviously, a long time ago, my family keeps telling that story of her summer job because it's about courage, self-sufficiency, tough women, and a sense of adventure. And those things help shape our family identity. So what kind of stories does your family tell? What ancestors give you courage? Maybe you remember a war veteran or a factory worker who organized a union or someone who marched with the civil rights movement. Perhaps you tell the story of a great-great-grandparent who traveled the Underground Railroad. Maybe you're inspired to help others by an ancestor who was a doctor or a teacher. Maybe you can feel your grandfather's musical talent in your fingers when you sit down at the piano. Or perhaps you don't know your family history or those stories, so You have your DNA analyzed and you take a deep dive into your international roots. Stories about the people who came before us help us understand ourselves. Our ancestors' stories are our origin stories. They help us place ourselves in a larger tradition. And when we have an understanding of where we've been, we have a better idea of who we are and where we're going. This morning's first reading from Nehemiah tells an ancestry story. By the time Nehemiah writes this book of the Bible, a lot has happened to the Jewish people. A long, long time ago, they escaped from Egyptian slavery into freedom in the Promised Land. And after living with judges and then with kings, things started going wrong. First, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to foreign invaders, and then the southern kingdom of Judah collapsed too. The invading Babylonians destroyed the temple, and they deported many people to Babylon, where they were cut off from their holy ground. And eventually, they were freed to return to a ruined Jerusalem. And when they saw those ruins, it was heartbreaking. They had to rebuild. In the book of Nehemiah, as the people get to work rebuilding the city of their ancestors, they listen to the priest Ezra as he gathers them in one place outside, and then he tells them their origin story and encourages them not to weep, but to have hope. 
Ezra reads to them from the book of the law of Moses, the law that God gave to their ancestors after delivering them from slavery in Egypt. For the people who are listening, those words of God's law aren't boring or punitive. They are precious. God's law took their scattered, tired, traumatized ancestors and turned them into God's own beloved people. Generations later, the people listening in the ruins of Jerusalem have been traumatized by their exile and the destruction of their city. They hear the story of the law again. And as they listen, even as they weep, they remember how much God loved their ancestors to give them this law. They remember that God's promises are supposed to be eternal, so God must love them too. God liberated their ancestors. Now God is liberating them. God's actions aren't long ago and far away. History is coming alive. Then we fast forward to the lifetime of Jesus. The Holy Land has once again been conquered by an empire, and the people's religious and political leaders are mostly Roman puppets and willing collaborators. Natives of Israel and Palestine are not physically exiled from their homelands, but they live like they're foreigners. They're non-citizens of the Roman Empire. They lack the empire's protections, and they still owe all of its taxes. In today's gospel reading, a young man named Jesus comes striding out of the wilderness, fresh off his 40-day fast, and the first thing he does is preach. When he gets to his hometown, he walks into the Nazareth synagogue. The townspeople gather to listen and learn. And just like the priest Ezra in the first reading, Jesus offers the people hope by reminding them of what God has done. He reads the words of the prophet Isaiah, who knew that there would be hope beyond the destruction of Jerusalem. And these are the words he reads. The Spirit of God is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. Jesus rolls that scroll back up and he tells the gathering, it's all happening right now. They are living in the fulfillment of that prophecy. God has not forgotten about them. And this is the same message of inspiration and love that Ezra preached to the people who stood among the ruins of Jerusalem that all of this has happened before, all of this is happening again. The power of the Bible lies in its simultaneous identity as a product of its history and as a living thing. Two millennia after Jesus stood in the Nazareth synagogue, communities of people around the world are still telling these ancient stories. They're still finding hope they're still seeing the fulfillment of God's promises. The Bible is like our family history or like our genealogy. It's full of stories we tell in order to remember who we are and whose we are. The Bible reminds us that God's love is not just ancient history, it is living. Enslaved people in the Americas looked to the stories of liberation in the Bible and they saw hope for their own freedom. Their descendants in the civil rights movement saw a mirror to that ongoing work of freedom. Impoverished people in Latin America heard of God's love for the poor and marginalized and marked their own liberation. LGBTQIA plus people heard stories of God's inclusive love in the Bible and took it into their own hands, turning the book that had hurt them into a book about their freedom. Here in Emmanuel, we've learned a little bit about what it's like to face adversity, some difficult circumstances that we didn't choose. We have not been exiled from Jerusalem, but this is the beginning of our third year of pandemic life. We are tired. 
we are worn out. We feel isolated. We feel demoralized. We feel disconnected from each other in our church community. As the never-ending pandemic grinds on and we feel stress in other parts of our lives, it can be difficult to imagine a hope-filled future for our congregation. We worry about attendance, finances, low energy. We grieve a past that will not return. We wonder where the heck God is in all of this. But people of Emmanuel, we are not alone. Our ancestors in the family of our faith have also felt tired, worn out, isolated, demoralized, disconnected. They endured generations of Egyptian slavery, wondering if God had forgotten them. They wandered out in the wilderness for 40 years, wondering if God had abandoned that promise to show them the promised land. They founded a nation and witnessed its invasion. They built a temple and witnessed its destruction. And now we're in the middle of an unplanned exile from our sanctuary again. They were exiled from their place of worship too. They experienced what it was like for worry to turn into lasting anxiety that turned into hopelessness as years passed. And God was still with them. God was with the Israelites who wandered through the wilderness, and God is with us as we seek a promised land we cannot yet see. God was with the people who lived in exile, teaching them how to plant gardens wherever they found themselves. And God is with us as we long for a return to normal. God is still showing us how we can live with love and compassion right here and now in our living rooms and our daily lives while we wait for normalcy. These are the gardens we plant. God brought the people out of exile to rebuild their city into something both old and new, and God is with us too as we stand at Emmanuel's threshold between what has been and what may yet be. When we gather for worship, whether we're here in this room or we are gathered online, and when we open the Bible, we don't just read our history. We read what is happening right now. We read stories that resonate with our struggles, and we read possibilities. Today, these words are already being fulfilled among us. And so I wonder, what does it look like for us to believe these words and to live into them? That today, the Spirit of God is upon us. God has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. God has sent us to proclaim release to the captives and healing to those who need it. God has sent us to let the oppressed go free. And even 2022 can be the year of God's favor. Amen. Yes.
God, we are your children. Your spirit lives in us, and we are in your spirit. Hear us, for it is your spirit who speaks through us as we pray. God, hear us. God, you created the heavens and the earth. Bless the produce of our land and the works of our hands. God, hear us. You created us in your own image. Teach us to honor you in all your children. God, hear us. You sent your Son into the world. Reveal him to others through his life in us. God, hear us. You broke down the walls that divide us. Bring the people of this world to live in peace and concord. God, hear us. You taught us to pray for kings and rulers. Bless and guide all who are in authority. God, hear us. You were rich, yet for our sake you became poor. Move those who have wealth to share generously with those who are poor. God, hear us. You, you cured by your healing touch and word. Heal the sick and bless those who minister to them. God, hear us. God, we know that you are good and that you hear those who call upon you. Give to us and to all people what is best for us, that we may glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In our service, we pause to give thanks to God for everything that God has given to us first. Here at Emmanuel, our ministry is only possible because of your support, and we are so grateful for your support. If you'd like to help support this ministry today, you can go to our website, emmanuelnb.org, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you'll find a link to donate. And if you would rather not make a donation online or that link is not working for you, you are also welcome to use the good old-fashioned U.S. mail to to make a contribution if you choose. We are at 3 Kirkpatrick Street here in New Brunswick. We are so grateful for the gifts you have offered, both monetary and non-monetary. And we gather all of these gifts now in a virtual sense. I'm imagining like they're here in my arms right now. And I invite you to pray with me as we give thanks for these gifts and we offer them back to God. The source of being is above, which gives life to all people, where people are satisfied and do not die of famine. For God gives them life, that they may live prosperously on the earth and do not die of famine. God, source of being, receive these gifts we offer. Use them to transform the world into a place of justice and peace where everyone has enough. Amen. And people, as you prepare to go from this place, receive this blessing. Archbishop Desmond Tutu reminded us of these truths. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through God who loves us. You are blessed by God who strengthens you to stand against evil. You are blessed by Christ who strengthens you to love when loving is difficult. You are blessed by the Spirit who strengthens you to shine in shadowed places. God blesses you today every day. Amen. Here are a few announcements before we go about the rest of our days, a few announcements for our life together as a congregation. First, a reminder that our annual meeting is happening next Sunday, and it will be in 100% virtual form. The annual meeting is happening at 1 p.m. next Sunday, January 30th. You can participate via Zoom in either a high-tech or a low-tech form as you choose. There are instructions on how to join that meeting in the most recent issue of Tidings. 
There are also instructions in this past week's Wednesday email, and there will be instructions in this week's Wednesday email as well. So you can either join from your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop or computer, or you can take the low-tech low option and just make a phone call to participate if you'd rather do it that way. Both are fine. So that meeting starts at 1 next Sunday, um, although it, you will be able to join from about 1240 onward. I encourage you to join earlier rather than at 103 so that our um, meeting administrators can verify your identity, figure out who you are, put you in the right place, and admit you to that meeting. Um, the bulletin of reports for the annual meeting will come out most likely tomorrow via email. If you are not an email user, uh, that will come to you in the mail this week. Next Sunday is also a festive day of worship for us, although we will still be here as the skeleton crew. We will be rejoicing together virtually as we mark the annual Reconciling in Christ Sunday. This is a Sunday of festive worship shared by congregations across the ELCA who, like us, are designated Reconciling in Christ, which means that we welcome, affirm, and um, enjoy the full participation of people who are LGBTQIA+. So that is our celebration Sunday for that. Next Sunday, we'll hear a message from the leadership of Reconciling Works. We'll have some special music. And I'm really looking forward to worshiping with you. It should be a joy-filled way to set the stage for our annual meeting later in the day next Sunday. We are happy to see that COVID cases are continuing to decline across our state. And finally, the percent positivity is starting to come down too. Things are not 100% safe right now, but we're headed in the right direction. So we are looking forward to resuming indoor in-person worship, provided these trends continue, on Sunday, February 6th. And of course, our live stream will still be provided, so perhaps on that day we will see some of your faces here in the flesh and others, your presence online. So it will be good to return to that worship format on Sunday the 6th of February. And finally, a reminder that the pantry is open this Thursday at 2 o'clock p.m. I'm just going to take a peek at my laptop to see if I forgot anything. Nope, Vanessa usually reminds me in the comments if I've forgotten about something. And seeing nothing, I think we are good. So we will go forth with these words, to Mamina, send me Jesus. Jesus. 